Let's talk to Mark Oswald. He's a strategist at EDMISI. Very good morning to you, young Mark. Good morning. Right, now, I've said this is your soapbox section. <laughs> um, you've talked off air what you want to talk about. I'm just basically going to wind you up and let you get going. Let's talk about steel. Okay, huge overcapacity in China. Yep. Where, does it, where does this, what, in terms of the fundamentals this week, what, what's changed in the world? Well, Obviously, um, it's unwelcome that Mr. Uh, Trump is going down the Smoot-Hawley route of imposing tariffs. Um, uh, it doesn't really matter what the tariffs are. I think that there's a couple of perspective points here. Because in the first instance, when we look at a lot of these trade tariffs which were, in, in, were being introduced, we suspect that Trump's main target is China. Um, actually, scratch below the surface here and let's have a look at um, some of the facts. Um, uh, China isn't even in the ten, top 10 exporters of steel product to the USA. It may be by far the biggest steel exporter in the world, but it actually accounts for just 2% of US steel right. uh, imports. Okay. Uh, the countries which are likely to get hurt, and this is where I think you know, the, the Trump doctrine here really seems to be always going the wrong way around. He attacks China but picks a fight with Canada, right. because Canada is the biggest steel exporter to the USA, followed by um, Brazil, followed by South Korea, Japan, Australia, all feature fairly heavily in there. They're much more, much more significant. You're talking about numbers in the region of 10% or more in terms of steel imports. Um, what about aluminium? That would be another one where we would say, well, you know, China's even bigger in that proportionately. Uh, well, is it? Um, yes, it is. Um, and it's very true that in terms of aluminium foil, um, the Chinese uh, overproduction since about 2006 has certainly dampened prices. But then let's have a look again, you know, how would the um, American producers of aluminium actually benefit from this? And the fact of the matter is, that was back in 2006 that the Chinese started having a major impact on aluminium prices. Well, the fact of the matter is, most American uh, producers of aluminium exited the foil market more than 20 years ago. So they're hardly likely to go be coming, on, you know, uh, coming back to the market to start producing this stuff. Um, <clears throat> but what it will do on the other side of the equation is raise the price of steel imports, and that will have a very, very negative impact on US automakers. So we're likely to see a bit more inflation on that front because their margins are fairly low in any case, yep. so they'll have to pass that through. Okay, so that, that's one area where we're going to see a little bit of an inflationary impact here. Um, let's talk about another area which is highly topical, particularly in, in Western Europe at the moment, and that's the, the blast from the east that we're getting and all this bad weather. Um, the fact of the matter is grains have been under something of a cloud for quite some time. Um, there was a massive out, uh, um, overproduction in Russia last year, and there was a big surplus in the tune of something like 15 million uh, tons, which they will be letting go onto the world market this year. But it may be actually taken up quite easily, because when you actually look at the various weather patterns that we've had, we've got a severe drought in um, the winter wheat growing region in the USA, which is clearly going to impact output. It's going to really reduce it quite heavily. And the problem with the, the, this icy blast that we've had over the last couple of weeks in Europe is unusually this year. Normally, you have a lot of snow cover on the ground um, going into January. And so if you do get a, a bout of cold weather, the snow cover there protects what's in the ground. Unfortunately, this year, actually, there was almost no snow cover at all until we got this icy blast, by which time a lot of the winter wheat is growing. Right. So it's probably going to do quite a lot of damage to the, the um, wheat crops um, in Europe, and, and you're already seeing it in wheat prices starting to push up. So we are see, seeing areas which have been benefiting from technological advances, from huge uh, surpluses, starting to move into much, much better balance. Um, and so we're probably going to see a little bit more of a push on, on the inflationary side of the equation. So that takes us to the question of the week, which was, um, <clears throat> what was Mr. Powell trying to tell us in his semi-annual testimony? <clears throat> um, I think the market's take, um, well, the, the market's take was that he was sounding slightly more hawkish. I think one you know, has to be, uh, put this in a little bit of perspective. Uh, I think what Mr. Powell is trying to do, and I think that's also the case with the Bank of Japan and the ECB and indeed the Bank of England, 
is carve out a little extra room for manoeuvre. If we do start to see inflation picking up, uh, not in a way which is really threatening, but in a way which will make sure that basically these inflation targets will start get, getting it, they need room for manoeuvre. And as Mr. Pollos from the Bank of Canada was saying yesterday, markets are basically going to do all right for the time being with a little let, less guidance. And this is really where the game has got in terms of the gradual exit from this extreme monetary accommodation that we've had. Uh, they all need a bit more room for manoeuvre. Obviously, if we start seeing this breaking down, it will pushing uh, equity markets down, credit spreads wider, credit yields higher, um, they will serve to temper that. But one of the reasons that they want more room for manoeuvre is the fact of the matter is, is we've seen a spectacular loosening of financial conditions since the first Fed first started tightening policy. And now as we've gone through four rate hikes, headed for a fifth in March without a shadow of a doubt, um, and they're seeing actually financial conditions being extremely loose, much, much looser than they were actually when they started tightening, which is obviously actually counter to what they've been intending. So I think we are at a point, and it is interesting, this observation that a couple of people have made uh, <clears throat> this week, that um, financial markets tend not to react to, at the beginning of a tightening cycle. It, quite often, it's only about 30 months in, which is roughly 13, 30, months. 30, three, three zero, okay. um, where you start to see the, the financial markets start to take, take this seriously on board. And it is this point that we're now actually with the US, but not with Europe or Japan, or indeed really the UK, at a point where the short-dated yields or the quasi-cash instruments, such as um, uh, one-year LIBOR is 2.5%, the US uh, two-year yields are around about 220 they are investable. So we're now at that point where people don't actually have to take quite as much credit risk. Yep. So I, I think this has been something of a seminal week. Do we necessarily get a complete breakdown in um, riskier assets? I don't think so. Um, but there is obviously quite a lot of scope for a correction, given we've reached quite head, heavy, heady levels in terms of equity markets, and credit spreads remain remarkably tight. On that note, Mark, <coughs> thank you very much.